We are the people of Texas. I write my own speeches. There are dozens of people that will write speeches. And anyone can stand up and give a memorized speech with lines. And any 12-year-old can deliver a punch. But I'm going to tell you something that's a big difference when you've actually seen the spirit of Texas. The words, the line, I have seen the spirit of Texas first came to me when I met a young man with disabilities at a family cemetery in the deep woods in rural East Texas. He came to me after I spoke at a gathering. He rolled his wheelchair across that rough ground of the cemetery and he put a, a stick between his teeth. And with an alphabet board, he spelled out the words, I love you. And that's the spirit of Texas. Over a decade later, I watched my youngest son <clears throat> struggling to overcome a head injury from an automobile accident sit at a computer keyboard trying to spell out the same three words because he couldn't talk. That spirit to survive, that determined spirit to communicate and reach out to other human being, beings, that spirit of love is Texas. It is one heart, the same heart, that binds us together. We don't talk about it enough. We don't remember it often enough. We forget that, it, that this shared humanity is the same for all, rich and poor, black or white, Latino or Asian, Democrat or Republican, liberal or conservative. It is what makes us human, and we certainly don't talk about it much at political conventions. But I will tell you, it's what makes us great. I see a world today where there's too much fiery rhetoric and too much hatred spewed across the airwaves and through the internet without regard for the truth, without regard for consequences of the vile hatred that's put upon our children and our fellow man. I see too many in the political arena willing to say any lie, distort any fact, destroy any hard-fought life to gain advantage. And you and I suffer for it. We suffer as a country for it. It speaks to our character. It speaks to our character both individually and collectively. And serving in the United States Senate is all about character. Don't doubt it for a minute. You can tell a lot about a man's character by the campaign he runs. I've watched for six months and listened to the dribble out of the Republican candidates for Senate. I've watched them accuse each other of lying. I've watched Politico do fact checks on what they say and call it reckless disregard for the truth or misrepresentation, which is a nice way of saying a lie. And you know, when you say it one time, that's one thing. But our lieutenant governor says it over and over and over again, even when it's told it's false. And folks, if you will lie to get elected, what will you do to stay elected? Isn't it a little bit of time? Isn't it time for us to speak clearly about what character means and about how important it is to all of us? If I cannot reflect that character for you, if the person that you elect to be the United States Senator cannot reflect that, then we all suffer. It is what's missing in our country today. There are many issues that divide us, but there are some things that define us and our character. We call ourselves Democrats because we believe in the value of hard work. We believe in the dignity of all of our citizens, regardless of their faith or skin tone or ancestry. We are a people of faith committed to the protection of free exercise of individual faith and will defend the right to those that have no faith. We believe in the great constitution of our country, a constitution that despite what the Republicans say, 
does not belong to them. It belongs to all of us. It is a constitution of all of us in this great country. We believe in a strong defense, and we will use our military strength to protect our citizens and our freedoms. These are common American beliefs that do not belong to any one party. They certainly don't belong to the Republican Party. And I'm sick and tired of them trying to claim them all. But there are issues that make us different as Democrats. We believe that opportunity in this country should be shared by all and that all should have equal opportunity to it. While others may believe that government exists to make the rich get richer, we believe our government has the responsibility to protect the less fortunate, be compassionate to the downtrodden as they rebuild their lives, and keep its promise to the elderly. The Republican candidates for the Senate have had 35 different media events. I've been invited to one. And in those 35 media events, this is what we know. See if this is who you are. We know they oppose Social Security and its current benefits. We know that they oppose Medicare and Medicaid and their current benefits. We know they oppose the Affordable Health Care Act, including elimination of the pre-existing condition exception. They oppose free annual screenings for our seniors. They oppose closing the donut hole for prescription medication. They oppose allowing our children to remain on our insurance to age 26. They, they oppose the efficiencies of sa and savings of coordination of care under the Affordable Health Care Act. They oppose increased funding of education. They oppose the right to work and workplace safety. They oppose the protection of clean water and clean air through the EPA. They oppose the woman's right to control her own health care. They oppose coverage of contraception for women. They oppose even the renewal of the Violence Against Women Act to protect women from domestic abuse. They oppose renewal of that act. They oppose the elimination of the discrimination of all of our citizens to the right to marriage, same-sex marriage. They oppose the DREAM Act. They oppose to any pathway to citizenship for undocumented workers, no matter how onerous or difficult it may be, and they even risk the full faith and credit of this great country to embarrass the duly, duly elected President of the United States of America. That's what they stand for. Is that what we are? Is that what you want? These are the issues and freedoms at stake in the race for the United States Senate. And we have not even mentioned the egregious disenfranchising of, every, of the very right to vote in this country, or the tax breaks for the wealthy, or the tax cuts for the corporations, or the granting of unlimited money to corporations and calling it free speech. They will destroy our right to election. They are about destroying your right to vote. You know, they claim they're patriotic. When I was raised, patriotism means we defend the right to vote, not take it away. I've heard them stand and declare their Christianity, but that's not the Christianity I was raised to believe in. The Christianity in every religion in this world professes the duty to, to take care of the sick and affirmed and disabled and the poor. That's not what the Republican Party stands for. That's what this party stands for. And if you're going to start wearing your faith on your sleeve, then you better stand up to the plate and start preach, living what you preach. But there is no issue. Aren't you sick of that? You know, aren't you sick? It amazed me in watching the Republican senatorial candidates try to outpour each other. They tried to outpour each other. How they all tried to talk about how poor they were. How they all tried to say they came from broken families 
okay? Well, let me set the record straight. I came from a family with a mother and father that loved me, that raised me, took me to school, and educated me, and it's just as much of the American dream as anything else, okay? We don't have to make up stories, and we don't have to prove how poor we are to understand what Texas needs. But we do have to understand the spirit of Texas, and we have to understand what our duty is to each other. I want to talk to you just for a minute about a young man I got to meet a couple of weeks ago. Perhaps no issue defines the difference between the two parties better than the DREAM Act. And perhaps no act is more misunderstood in parts of our state than what the DREAM Act really means. This young man is 20 years old. He was brought to this country by his mother and father on a work visa at age 10. His mother and father stayed beyond their visa. He went on to graduate with honors from high school. He went to the University of Houston and is receiving a degree in mathematics. He is a campus leader, and his friends and fellow students believe he has a great future, and he's starting to get job offers. But this young man can't get a job, because at the bottom of that form of employment, he can't check. I'm a United States citizen. He has no pathway to be a United States citizen. Now, the Republican candidates for the United States Senate, when asked about the DREAM Act, called that young man and, men, and young women and men like that criminals. Their exact words. These are criminals. They call them illegals. They say, it's amnesty. Send them home. Well, if you send that young man home, he goes to jail. Is that who we are? Is that the state of Texas? Is that the way you were raised? Is that what you want your state to be? You know, politicians like to end speeches with a phrase. God bless Texas. We say God bless Texas because it makes us feel good. And it makes you feel good. But listen carefully to me. God forgive us if we forget that young man and the 30,000 kids trapped without a country, without a future in this great state. And you know the worst part of it? That young man looked me in the eye and he apologized. And he said, I feel guilty because this great country educated me. And now I'm of the age where I can give back, where I can give back, where I can work and pay taxes, but you won't let me. And I said, just one minute. That's the biggest lie in the whole DREAM Act debate. You see, they call those children freeloaders. But we pay for education in this state through the gasoline tax, through property tax, and through sales tax. And every day that his mother and father filled up their car with gas, they went to the store and shopped, and they paid their rent, they paid for his education. Just like I paid for my children's education, and it's a lie that we must stop. Don't you feel guilty, young man. You earned your right. We're the ones that should be embarrassed. We're the ones that should feel guilty because we haven't allowed that young man to become part of the American dream and be part of the greatest country on this earth. That's all he wants. In 1968, Robert Kennedy gave what many believe to be one of the greatest speeches of all time, titled The Mindless Menace of Violence. I want you to listen to his words and think of that young man. I'm not going to read all of them, just a few of them. 
Too often we honor swagger and bluster. Too often we excuse those who are willing to build their own lives on the shattered dreams of other human beings. But this much is clear. Violence breeds violence. Repression brings retaliation. And only a cleansing of our whole society can remove this sickness from our souls. For when you teach a man to hate and fear his brother, when you teach that he is a lesser man because of his color or his beliefs or the policies he pursues, when you teach that those who differ from you threaten your freedom or your job or your home or your family, then you also learn to confront others not as fellow citizens but as enemies to be met not with cooperation, but with conquest, to be subjugated and mastered. We learn at last to look at our brothers as aliens, alien men whom we share a city, but not a community, men bound to us in common dwelling, but not in common effort. We learn to share only a common fear, only a common desire to retreat from each other, only a common impulse to meet disagreement with force. Surely we can learn, at the least, to look at those around us as fellow men. And surely we can begin to work a little harder to bind up the wounds among us to become in our hearts brothers and countrymen once again. I talk about the spirit of Texas and one heart. And if I can be so bold to add to Senator Kennedy's words, I would say, it is in the moments of life, in the hallways of schools and hospitals, at the little league ball games and the soccer matches, it's sitting in the pews, hearing the rhythmic sounds of the African American church or the small shelter of a church in the valley it's across the windswept plains of West Texas in the Panhandle or in the small family cemetery in East Texas when we are stripped bare of all the trappings of bias and prejudice that we know we remain a single beating heart. That is Texas and that's why it matters. At our very best, we, the people of Texas, reflect that spirit and that single heart. And my friends, that is who your next United States Senator must be. My name is Paul Sadler. I'm a candidate for the United States Senate. Will you stand with me?